Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Um, my name is Lauren Luckett. I head up uh, strategic partnerships here at OBO. We're happy to have you all join us for our uh, virtual event today for our AE Design Service Roadshow. Uh, Curtis has been traveling around the last couple of months spreading the word about the program, um, OBO, and what we've got coming up in our pipeline. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to him. Curtis Clay is our Director of Architecture here, and he's just uh, going to take us through the presentation. Uh, while he's going through that, I'm going to be dropping into the chat some links for everyone, including a link to Slido. Uh, you can also see the QR code on the first page of the deck. Please submit your questions there, and at the end, we've got a portion for a Q&A that we'll be taking uh, you guys through. Curtis? All right, thanks, Laura, and thank you for all your hard work getting this all set up and helping me organize these roadshows uh, visits around the country. So thank you for everyone that's joining. Uh, we were recently in Kansas City, Austin, Minneapolis, New Orleans, and we were hoping to maybe get to the West Coast before the end of the year, but time did not permit. But uh, perhaps in the new year, uh, we can get out to the West Coast, do some more of these. But thank you for those of you that are able to join virtually today. I see a lot of familiar faces coming into the lobby there right before we are starting. So welcome, thank you all. So my name is Curtis Clay. I'm the Director of Architecture for OBO. And yeah, I just move forward to the next slide here. Here we go. This is running a little delayed. There we go. So I've been with OBO since 2015. Also spent some time in the private sector. Uh, really fell in love with this work, working on this typology, this uh, overseas building operation typology. Um, back in 2005, 2006, and just couldn't get away from from back uh, here with the department. I've done a couple of these projects as a design manager, and then in October, uh, right before the pandemic, <laughs> the director of architecture, this so, uh, be with you here today. <laughs> as I'm going to give an overview of the program, we'll talk about the executive order uh, recently released on uh, climate change. Tackling climate change. I can do some work on this. It'll be on IDIQ, and then give you some lot of bunch of sexy pictures from our design portfolio <laughs> about the embassy effect, which is the impact that these projects have uh, overseas. So my hope is that through the information we're providing today, it'll give you some insights into what's important to us, uh, the kinds of things we care about as you consider proposing and joining our program. So just from there's that. So. Are, we are basically responsible for modernizing, innovating, and impacting the U.S. global portfolio. Um, our mission is to provide safe and secure facilities for all of our diplomats overseas, and those buildings should represent the best of American architecture, engineering, technology, art, and so forth. So security is the number one reason why we get our money to do this work, um, and that is really what's driving a lot of the decision-making process that we are making design decisions. A little bit about our climate security, the of these facilities, and our security relative to terrorism, and then stewardship. We have a large number of projects in the portfolio. Um, you can really trace the history of American architecture through our program. And now we have a lot of these buildings by modern masters like I.M. Tay, Walter Gropius, Marcel Brewer, that are reaching the end of their useful life. So we're reaching a point where now the stewardship of these amazing buildings that we have in our portfolio also becomes a very important priority for us. Collectively, whether that's us as the government and you as our consultants, um, customer service is number one. Uh, when we are sending you out and we're going with you to meet with local building officials, or working with utility companies and countries around the world, you become an extension of the diplomatic core. And so that culture of customer service is something that we strive for. The other thing is because we're developers and owners and we operate our own buildings, total cost of ownership is one of those things that drives a lot of our decision-making process. Lastly, proactive risk management, making sure we're making good design decisions that are reducing risks for the construction teams in the field building our projects, and then for the people that are gonna be operating and maintaining them after they're actually completed. Brief little history about the program you can go all the way back to Thomas Jefferson as one of the earliest diplomats where they were sent over to the countries and actually had to purchase their own property 
uh, that served as a diplomatic enclave for the United States. But it was, wasn't really until the bombings in Beirut and Nairobi that we really became a continuously funded program through the SECA law, which was passed in Congress. Uh, what that did was not only establish strong security criteria, but also set up a dedicated funding stream for this work. And uh, we've gone through a series of stylistic and approaches to how we execute this work. We've done a standard embassy design. We were trying to move as many people in as quickly as possible. We've done design excellence. Uh, we Now we're, I think, in a nice place where we have the best of uh, the repeatable elements in our projects that are consistent across all of our, all of our work, uh, while still bringing great design to all these local communities. And the, the other important thing to know is after SECA, we've been consistently funded at the tune of about $3 billion a year here for the last three years. But no matter the administration, whether it's Democratic or Republican, uh, the safety and security of our diplomats abroad really drives uh, our program. Public servants like myself, we're not really you know, interested or motivated by who's in power. It's really about how we take care of our foreign officers overseas. This is our big numbers slide. Um, the thing I just want to point you to a couple things. One, these buildings, because they maintain and contain a lot of historical artifacts that have been donated to ambassadors over the years, um, they're not only office spaces and secure spaces, they're also museums. Um, and they're also, in many ways, um, the center of life for people in that country, the Americans that are located in that country. So you'll find that we have recreational facilities, a number of different also aspects of these projects as well. Uh, we have a large number of historical properties, 44 officially registered on the Secretary's Register. Um, but then we also have uh, a large number of art pieces in the program as well. The other important thing to note is this huge maintenance backlog. So we have 3 billion of deferred maintenance. And what's gonna be important is that as we move forward, um, getting projects that are actually modernizing and improving um, that is also important. There we go. Um, to talk a little bit about the different typologies, the different project types, um, each country has one embassy. The other buildings in that country would be the consulates, but we also have a large uh, amount of residences that we're responsible for, whether they're ambassadors residences, Marine security guard residences, or the actual housing for um, the people that are living there with their families abroad. Um, we have warehouses and shops in many cases, uh, so we don't have to try to buy everything on the local market. We store a lot of things on site. We also have the number of cultural heritage properties I mentioned to you as well. The other thing is we have a broad range of program types. Some posts are very small, some are very large. Um, a large range of climactic considerations. Um, Ulaanbaatar, where it's minus 40 degrees five months out of the year, to Doha, Qatar, where it's 130, 140 degrees out of the year. A wide range of security postures, depending on the threat level of a particular post as well. So um, they range in project size from small to very, very large. Um, they range in complexity from not very complex to very complex. And they range in their uh, threat level to low to very, very high. So we really run the gamut of all the various project types. As you see, we're almost everywhere, except for what, Afghanistan, Yemen. Uh, so the, you, you name on your hand, one hand, the amount of places that we're not. But what, this, what I show you this slide is to show you that um, there's a very diverse regional geographic considerations that need to be considered. Uh, also diverse cultural considerations need to be considered when we're doing these projects in all these various locations abroad. So we currently have about 600 active projects with a total value in design or construction uh, with a total value of about $34 billion. So uh, this is holdover work. Our money is no year money. So we get to keep working on our, on our projects regardless because these are essential services. Um, so when the government shuts down, we do not. Uh, we keep working and our diplomats abroad keep working as well. In terms of the projects, they keep moving forward as well. Uh, we do lead everywhere uh, we can. Our legal requirement is to meet federal energy performance goals. We use LEED Silver as the vehicle to achieve those energy, energy performance goals. And we do achieve some gold and some platinum in some places, but it's important to note that we're not in the interest of uh, chasing LEED points for the sake of reaching higher certifications. What's really important to us is that the project is responding to the actual considerations on the ground in that country. As you'll see when I show you some of the work, uh, we're 
designing buildings and places, really whole campuses and places that have no water infrastructure, no energy, power infrastructure, no wastewater infrastructure. Um, so it just requires for our own security and resilience of those campuses to introduce items that actually keep us operating and sustainable for extended periods of time. Naturally, that gains a lot of lead points, but uh, I just point that out to say that, you know, if you see a lead gold, a lead platinum, it's not something that we're just actively going after chasing points. So making the right decisions is what's important to us. So here is the major capital construction program. We have, we get red money for red things, blue money for blue things, and there's different things we can spend our money on. Our major capital construction program are the big new campuses and embassies that we do. So this is an outlook of what we plan on doing across the globe over the next five years. If you look at um, what we just awarded in FY22, we just in September completed a total of about $3.1 billion of project awards. Uh, that's a total of a number of COVID year holdovers, 2021 up to 22. So we had a really big year in September. Um, but normally and going forward in the future, we do about two or three big, big major capital projects a year. And you'll see that that also, this money also includes our major site acquisitions as well. If you look up to the right, you'll see what's left to do for the entire portfolio. Um, the history of the program was about moving as many diplomats to a safe, secure facilities as quickly as possible. So we took care of a lot of the big ones. What's coming next in the program are smaller posts, but in more urban areas um, that are gonna be more expensive and much more complex. So we're entering, entering a really exciting time of the program because I think these projects are gonna become more and more interesting uh, and more complex as we try to do the projects that are left in the portfolio. We also do a number of major rehabilitations and compound security upgrades, maintenance projects. So here's the major projects we plan on doing uh, across the globe over the next five years. And if you look again, many of these are electrical upgrades, uh, lease fit outs, uh, consular services, fire system replacements. Um, these are maybe small, uh, but these are mighty projects to go a long way to really making the quality of life really strong at post. And we also, in terms of delivery methods, um, primarily what, the way we deliver our projects are is through design build with bridging documents. What that does is allow us to shift the risk to the contractor uh, much more faster. It helps us spend the money because once we have awarded that design build project at about 35%, um, in Congress's eyes, we've spent the money. And, and our one of our metrics of success is how quickly we're moving to move our uh, staff into uh, more safe facilities. So. Uh, speed schedule as you're listening for the keywords that are important to us uh, being efficient um, this fiscal year though we're actually doing something interesting we're actually trying two new delivery methods uh, for our hanoi project we're doing that one via cmc and our adana competition is design competition is actually undergoing right now where we're actually going to be awarding the contractor and the architect concurrently uh, at the same time uh, but we have done some design bid build, um, but most of the time it's design build with bridging, which is how we do most of our work. Um, OBO or the State Department is essentially the landlord uh, for all of these facilities overseas. So in every location around the world, depending on which government agency has an interest in that particular country, they might be a tenant of ours in that particular location. So for example, uh, NASA is in Moscow because they have international space, space station relations with that country or uh, countries where they're dealing with reforestation issues, the Department of Agriculture might be there, or where we're doing aid, USAID may be there. So um, it really depends on the mission of that particular country. And if there's a government agency here that's an interest in that country, they may actually be a tenant. So uh, we often say if you've done one OBO project, you've done one OBO project, because they're all a little bit different in terms of the makeup and the requirements and needs for that particular location. And like I mentioned, because we are owners and developers, really all aspects of the building process, uh, we engage AE services for, whether that's very early on in our master planning, uh, with our site acquisitions, we do a lot of studies to figure out if this is the right site for the program we're thinking about doing, all the way through the post occupancy evaluations and ongoing maintenance and repair projects. So uh, really it's a total life cycle effort. Our focus here today is on those sections in blue, uh, the project design, development and construction. So I'm going to move on to talk a little bit about the most recent executive order that was issued by the president. And the thing that's important to note is that um, you'll see that 
they're putting really climate security as really the forefront of foreign policy. We find that there are these five global drivers that really are impacting all of our projects overseas. We've either recently built or are planning to build in 18 of the top 20 megacities all around the world. We take out New York and LA. And so, and primarily they're all very large population centers. They have, um, they're usually coastal located, so they have flooding issues. So uh, whether it's technology, whether it's how we deal with resources, uh, these global drivers are really impacting our work. So we're really interested in firms that uh, can think about how these global drivers really impact the work that you show us. Additionally, if you look at this map, you'll see uh, in blue are displacements around the world due to climate disasters. And in orange are displacements around the world due to terrorism or some sort of conflict. So very quickly, we're seeing that climate is impacting our work just as much, if not more so, um, than conflicts in various parts around the world, which is why we put climate as a security issue for us. Since we get our money for security, we're a security-driven organization, um, climate becomes a security issue for us. And as I mentioned, um, the executive order really puts climate at the forefront of foreign policy. And it's really a government-wide approach to the climate crisis. And since we have all aspects of government located in our buildings, and it's how we partner with these various um, countries around the world, our buildings are really becoming centers for that diplomatic engagement on climate at various locations. Internally at OBO, what are we doing about this right now? We're asking for money, first of all. <laughs> Hopefully with the uh, uh, omnibus bill gets passed here in the next day or two, uh, we'll get some of that money to start to implement a lot of these um, goals that we're trying to achieve. But in many parts of the world, uh, they don't have electrical vehicle charging stations, and really, we're, they don't really make armored electric vehicles yet. So we're working to put infrastructure in place for projects, and then maybe we'll put the charging stations in later when the, that country's infrastructure can catch up. So uh, we're working really hard and looking at our entire portfolio to really figure out what's the best way for us to implement a lot of these goals that have been established by the president. We also have internally our Climate Security and Resiliency Program, which coordinates across government. Uh, to ensure that whether we're looking at tsunamis, or earthquakes, or hurricanes, and floods, working with NOAA and NASA, and various other government agencies, so that we're really thinking about our existing sites, and as we're thinking about acquiring new sites, how will these natural disasters impact the potential purchase of a site that we're thinking about doing? So I can promise you your government is working very smartly, I think, on, in this regard, to ensure that climate is not impacting our current portfolio, and future uh, site acquisitions as well. Um, for uh, on the innovation front, we're engaging with uh, research institutions around the country, uh, really focused on thinking about uh, how will these global drivers impact our portfolio in the future. So we've been looking at things like mass timber, how offsite manufacturing can help reduce schedules, um, nanoparticles in concrete, and a number of different aspects uh, that these universities are looking at for us to really look at, rather than a six-year outlook for the program, really looking at a 30-year outlook for our design standards and thinking about how our portfolio and our projects will be impacted in the future. Okay, so let's talk about the IDIQ. So an indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity contract is our primary vehicle for how we award this work to AEs. Um, we do that because after we do the whole process and we make our selections, um, you still have to get your facility cleared. You have to get the staff cleared through um, our clearance process to make sure that they're not foreign actors. Uh, and so there's a lot of activities that happen after we pick people to make sure that we have the right people working on this project and people that can actually handle or approve to handle classified information. So you don't have to have this before we start. This is not something that you have to do to apply. But if you are selected, I think it's important to note that it is quite an investment on your part. Uh, we've heard somewhere in the neighborhood of $100,000 or $150,000 to get the room and the equipment. Uh, it changes the culture of your office in that everyone needs to sign in. Um, so it's, it's you have to want to do this work, and it's important, and you have to just understand the risks and the impacts that doing this work is going to have on your firm. So I just want to be very honest and open with you about that, that, you know, it takes an investment if you're selected. Um, and then 
you know, it's a pretty intrusive clearance process because it's we're guarding secrets of the United States government. And we have to be sure that the right people are that have access to these drawings or that are and you have network bifurcation in your office, but to make sure that the wrong people don't have access. So um, it's just important to know that. So for the IDIQ, we currently have three different IDIQ contracts. And so we've gone through these RFPs in the past. So these are who we award these particular projects to. Our first one is our top secret IDIQ. So there are certain locations in the world, uh, China, Russia, Cuba, we could probably name them on a couple of hands, where certain projects have additional security requirements need to be handled differently. Um, these firms actually have a top secret facility clearance process as for their facility and top secret cleared staff. So it's an extra layer of security on top of our normal security clearances. The bulk of our work is awards to this group of 16 architects currently. Uh, this is our current IDIQ. So um, we went out to the, to the RFP. We did a big competition. We did the interviews. And so this is the list that we hand most of our, all of our design work to actually currently. Additionally, we have, and the other thing I just want to point out on this slide is that um, in Kansas City and New Orleans, I heard some people, well, well, we're a small little firm. Would you really be interested in us? And, and the question answer is yes. Um, if you look at the firms on this list, um, they range in size, they range in scale. Um, we're looking at firms beyond just their scope of their, and their capacity. Um, we know if you are good at design and you are great thinkers and you are good problem solvers, uh, you can get additional capacity. We can help. We know firms that uh, do our work, um, that are clear, that can provide you the capacity you need. Uh, to execute a larger project. So um, it's not necessarily a requirement to be a large firm, but small firms, we just want great design firms uh, on our list. Um, and then additionally, we have our support services contracts. So our support services contracts, which we recently awarded during COVID times, thank you to our contracting folks who are on the call. Uh, we did all these interviews virtually. Uh, they do all of our thinking for us. It could be looking at the the pond in Beijing that is having a water filtration problem. It could be something larger like a master plan or country plan. It could be looking at constructability. It could be something as small as studying a particular stone for us that maybe a contractor is proposing for a substitute and having we've awarded like a petrographic analysis to someone to just look at that particular stone to see if it meets our requirements. Any range of things for any project that we may need to, to do some additional thinking or looking into recontract after a support services idea. So those three contracts that I, we are currently in place kind of make up number one, number two, and number four on this list to the left. Um, what we are conceiving is that there are a large number of these moderniz modernization or renovation projects potentially that could have their own IDAQ. We haven't finished writing the IDAQ. This is not a promise. It's not a guarantee. Uh, my contracting folks are watching me, so I, I know that they're going to jump on me if I say anything wrong. But um, this is what we're thinking we need. Um, we need people that are focused on these modernization projects, these renovation projects. We want to provide a small business opportunity. The other thing we want to do is build firms into the program. Uh, so maybe you start with support services, maybe you move into modernization and renovation, maybe you can jump right in at design. Um, but what we found is that it's tough to award a brand new $200, $200 million embassy to a brand new firm that's never done our work before. So I think that this is a great way for firms to get to know us, for us to get to know you, for us to get to know, for you to get to know our standards and make you really competitive uh, for the design IDIQ, the big design IDIQ when that comes out uh, in the future. So I want to give you an example of the kind of projects that we're conceiving. These are modernization, renovation projects at a smaller to medium scale, but are vastly important to us and sometimes very complex. So for example, we do American centers, which are a place for locals to come, use free and open internet, uh, learn about exchange programs for students at universities. Of course, Moscow is never going to build this one here, but uh, this is the American Center that we designed for Moscow. So it's on our campus, it's smaller, um, but it's a project that's really important to us in many locations around the world. We also do a large number of lease fit outs. So in many cases where we want to establish a presence, but we don't have the big budget or we don't have the time uh, to quickly get a presence in a particular location, this is a lease space in a mall that Marlon Blackwell is doing for us currently. This is the ground floor. And then at the upper levels, 
Um, they have a nice little patio for break, taking breaks. So uh, lease fit outs are really key in our development right now as we're still establishing more and more locations around the world. Uh, here's the embassy branch office in Jerusalem, which is another example of where we're building out a space in an existing facility. But these also must meet our security requirements as well. Additionally, in many places, uh, we may not have had Marines previously. This is an existing campus that uh, was guarded by the local guard force. But at some the security threat level change, we decided we're going to put Marines here, but they need a place to live. So MSGQ, and if I use any acronyms, I apologize. We kind of have our own language we like to speak with, but uh, that's a Marine security guard quarters. So in, in a couple places around the world where we have um, existing Marines, maybe we're expanding Marines, like here in Tunis, where we had a smaller Marine contingent, but then we chose to um, expand after we, uh, the embassy was attacked. And now, by, by law, they're currently double bunking, but they each need to have their own individual apartment. So um, we're doing a new MSGQ that's going to be bigger and larger, and then repurposing the old MSGQ into much needed office space on that campus. As you saw in our list of uh, of major capital projects for the next five years, there's also a number of site acquisitions. And so we found that getting architects engaged earlier and often in that process while we're considering purchasing a site during the due diligence period to actually help us do that due diligence, uh, study whether the program that we think we might want to put on this project site will actually fit uh, and meet all of our security requirements is something that we've been engaging AEs much earlier on. Some of these are very urban sites. Some of these are uh, add-ons to existing sites, like the one in Amman. It's a very complex, multi-phase. How could we actually, if we bought this site, how can we phase it to really keep everybody um, on the campus without disrupting everything? So these are the kinds of things and studies that uh, we need help with. Additionally, we, we have a large number of CMRs, which are chief of mission residences, which is basically the ambassador's house. And these have evolved from being um, palatial residences for that people bought from way back in the day to really becoming the center of some of the diplomatic engagements in a particular country, hosting upwards of two, 300 events a year. So they quickly become large dining room, large representational event spaces with commercial kitchens that just happen to have a three or four bedroom apartment on the top floor. Um, so we, this is an existing uh, ambassador's residence that we're repurposing into being utilized in the way that we know we're utilizing these embassies now these um, chief of mission residences now. And this is the view from that rear courtyard. A lot of big outdoor events, July 4th, we invite, uh, July 4th is a really big event date for our embassies abroad. So uh, this is one of those spaces where they needed that large outdoor space retained in order to really execute a great event. In addition to Waukeshot here was, a, it used to be the small campus when there was a very small footprint now it's being charged, changed into the ambassador's residence. So um, even a project like this, it's a residential project, but it has a representational space. It has a recreational zone, you can see the swimming pool. But we really want to make sure that we have a depth hand that's really linking these existing and these new facilities together, and being really sensitive to the architectural context, the cultural context, um, meeting all of our security requirements, while still creating a wonderful place for the ambassador to hold events and to work. Here's another uh, ambassador's residence in Sarajevo, currently in design by 1100 architects. And then this may not seem like much, but you know, um, accessibility is a really important part of our diversity, equity, and inclusion program. And it takes a deft hand to really add a really seamless accessible ramp to where it was there before. Um, upgrading bathrooms in this historic property. Um, upgrading the facilities, there were some level changes inside that had to be very carefully handled. So uh, this is not maybe a big sexy project, but it's something that's very important. It really changes the game that giving that dignity for anybody that comes um, to one of our facilities to show that they're not being brought in through the side door or the back door. And it really becomes that first step of that diplomatic outreach. The architecture and the design of these facilities um, are actual diplomatic acts. Okay, so that's an example of the kind of projects that we're thinking, um, but you know, this IDIQ could be something else. It's still um, in the works, so not promising what it's gonna be. Uh, could be the big one, could be a small one, we'll see. 
what I want to walk you through now is the actual the 2016 IDIQ. So um, these are available still. Um, oh, back one. So this is the whole process here first. So I'm going to walk you through this process. This is what we did in 2016. Um, it is not going to be the same on this one when we release it next year, um, but it will be pretty similar, but it's going to be different. But I just want to walk through so you can get a sense of the kind of uh, effort. One of the things we heard was that uh, it was a little too onerous in terms of what we were asking for. So we're talking to our contracting folks about things like potentially doing page limits, uh, maybe looking at whether all the projects need to be completed. And so there's a lot of conversations that are still happening based on the feedback that I've heard from you as we've been out uh, on the road uh, meeting with you all talking about this new contract. So you can write these two numbers down and maybe we can get those put into the chat there too. Um, these were the these are the numbers, these are still available on SAM.gov through the archives. You can look at the previous RFPs and contracts that we've put out. Uh, these are two that I'm going to highlight from 2016 that were the when we had a split between rehab and new design. So you can go back, you can look at what the submission requirements were, and really get a sense and understanding of the kind of effort it's going to take to apply for one of the, one of our projects. So we usually have a stage one and a stage two. Stage one is where we focus on the firm and the lead designer profile. So uh, we understand design talent moves around; it doesn't have to be. Um, the person that's been there at the firm forever. Uh, we So we bifurcate and split the firm's projects and the lead designer's uh, projects. What's important to us is to understand how you think about this work. What's your commitment to sustainable design? Um, how would you your work apply to our projects and our problems that we have? Um, the firm and the design portfolio does not need to be like a single individual master architect uh, of the past. It could be a studio, it could be a joint venture, it could be you know, a, a collective of people that are focused in one, like a particular studio inside of a firm, um, but that's how you want to put it to forth. So it, the one thing is they have to be, a, they all have to be United States persons, and that's defined um, by our, our contracting guidelines. You can look that up and see exactly what that means to be a United States person, but you have to be United States persons to work on these projects. Uh, we look at past performance, and previously we asked for five projects uh, that were completed in the last two years. So pay careful attention to the language in the contract. Um, what happens a lot is people with projects that are either completed in 12 years, 12 years ago, or not completed. And guess what? That's a great way to get disqualified real quick. Um, so meet the base requirements is the first uh, line of defense and check that I, we do when we look at who, because we're going to, if there's a way that we can eliminate people that we don't have to evaluate when there's 150, 200 submissions, like our, we're going to do it. So. Uh, make sure you're meeting the base requirements at a minimum. Um, and then the lead designer profiles, like I said, it could be an individual or a studio or collaborative. We're looking at professional experience, awards. Um, and we have a page limit on per person that you can actually use for that section as well. And then when we look at the lead designer's portfolio, so this can be different than the firm's portfolio. So the firm, it will, we'll look at the firm's past performance and then we'll look at the lead designer's portfolio and the lead designer's past performance. We want to know who's the person that we're going to be working with every day. It may be a firm, but we want to know who's the individual that you are assigning to work on OBO projects that's going to be solely focused on our work. Um, so we want to know about that person, if they've won awards, and what are the projects that they've worked on. And then in 2016, we asked for a lead designer statement. So like I said, Tell us what you think about our projects. What's the unique issues? I've shared some of those today that you see um, how you would solve some of the problems. So I don't know what that is gonna ask of, but usually it's gonna be some sort of statement and ask you to uh, discuss your approach to the work. So it's not until, so from that we'll pick a short list. So you don't have to grab your whole engineering team um, and all the consultants until stage two if you get past stage one. Um, I've heard a lot of people, well, what about engineers? Well. Get past stage one first, then you can assume your team. Obviously, you want to be building relationships uh, with teams. We had someone come into the interview, um, and this is like the first time they met them. They're like, hey, nice to meet you. So that gave us, you know, hey, well, you've never done anything, and you're showing us projects, but have you? do you really have a way of working together? What is that going to mean for us? So um, it's not till stage two where you actually put that team together. You'll submit materials. The panel will meet, the interviews, the ranking. Then the selection will happen, and that's when the clearance process starts. So in stage two, 
again, if you've never done an SF-330, standard form 330, it's available on the internet. Um, that's a form you can go and start working on and filling out right now. Uh, it's a form that was gonna be required for you and every single uh, consultant team member on your team. I will ask for your team makeup, management processes, and the interviews in 2016, they were in person. We set a limit on the number of people because it was in person and some people were gonna have to fly in. Um, we did it virtually uh, for the support services contract. It worked quite well. Uh, so I imagine we may do this next one virtually as well. We'll see. Okay, any questions on the idea? Can, should we go, when we keep moving or do we have questions on this that are worth stopping the answer? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> there are a few. Um, start at the top. Uh, does OBO prefer to contract mainly to architecture firms with engineer subcontracts or joint ventures between architecture firms and engineering firms viable solutions? No preference. We've done it both ways. We have some joint ventures as you saw on our um, that have a hold IDIQ. We have engineering firms directly that we've co contracted IDIQs with, and we also have. Uh, architecture firms that have engineering consultants. So um, if that's how you work and it works for us, then that's fine. Um, how important is in-country presence and or experience in being competitive for OBO project awards? Since you never know which country or where you'll be assigned a project, I'd say it's not important. Oftentimes we are gonna require you to hire a local architect anyway. Uh, so you'll have to find that based on the location. I mean, we don't expect people to have outreach in Ouagadougou and Chiang Mai and all these various 290 locations around the world. Um, that's not something where we can reasonably hold people accountable for. So um, local experience on the local market is something that we'll ask for if you are issued a task order for a particular project to ensure we're helping with zoning requirements and so forth and local codes and understanding the difference between local codes and our codes, we'll ask you to bring that consultant on board at that time based on the location. How likely is it that the new renovation modernization IDIQ will cause a firm to be precluded from large design build efforts? None at all. We have people on our regular design IDIQ and the top secret IDIQ. So we're looking for the best. We're not precluding anybody. And again, like I said, it's not a guarantee that it's going to be a modernization renovation IDIQ. Um, we're talking about the need that we really have right there. But um, yep, I, I fully expect everybody on the support services IDIQ to, to chase it if possible. So there are questions specific to the RFP as well that I'm going to like keep on the side just as an FYI I'd say for you okay. later. Um, and the other questions are um, well, okay. Will there be a specific small business? or other set-asides for the next IDIQ? I do not know the answer to that question at this time. So that's, uh, the contract, once it's finally written, we'll go through legal on all kinds of requirements and they'll make that determination. And similar vein, is there an IDIQ for subconsultants, i.e. landscape architects, and are subconsultants required to comply with the security requirements? Yeah, I should, I don't know, if that slide's not in here, but there's a lot of IDIQs that OBO puts out. Like I'm representing just a small portion. Um, there's our whole domestic operation at the State Department that handles all the consular uh, renovation projects, um, all domestically in the passport agencies all around the United States. There are roofing IDIQs, there's value engineering IDIQs, there's all, all kinds of IDIQs that go out and that from the chief, you just like set an alert on SAM.gov to find out when we release something, you'll see there's a large number of contracts that we put out that are also great ways to get to know the program, uh, to work on these projects abroad. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of different IDIQs. I don't know if there's a landscape specific one um, off the top of my head, but we can, we can find out. And then um, if we have one project with OBO, should we still apply to modernization IDIQ as a stepping stone to larger design IDIQ? Not precluded from doing that. So, you know, but we're not, um, it's not a requirement to have OBO experience, but it's nothing that prohibits you from uh, applying for our, our, our piece as well. And then uh, we will be releasing a copy of the slide deck. Uh, that one keeps coming up, that will be done. Um, 
We do not have an expectation for the dates on this. We're still working on it. That'll be coming down the pike. Um, and the expectations for a specific number of awards and all that coming down the pike. Um, so that'll be the information that'll all be released um, when it's finally completed and it comes out. I mean, I can't talk to everybody while it's out. So I'm getting out there a little early before it's really done so that we can spread the word and get people excited about it and ready about it, ready for it for when it comes out. So the kind of details of what's actually in it, I couldn't talk about them now anyway if we had them, but um, we don't have those those details that haven't been finalized yet. Including specific number of SBE firms and all that. None of that has been determined at this time. All right. All right. So what I'm gonna do now is just take you through a lot of the projects we currently have active, uh, talk to you a little bit about the kind of nuanced and unique problems that these projects uh, present um, to give you a sense of what's important to us, the kind of challenges that we're facing uh, so that you can try to find a way to align your work and to the things that are important to us and the challenges that we're facing. So that's really my intent here uh, is just to show off a bunch of great stuff I think we're doing, but also to help you understand uh, the complexities and the depth of work in, that we're currently working. So we also go through a very robust three concept design phase. So this is the current project in design by Marlon Blackwell and Bangui, Central African Republic. And, you know, like I mentioned earlier, I think this is a place, no water infrastructure, no power grid, no wastewater infrastructure. So, you know, a really robust response of how we're doing, dealing with solar, battery storage, uh, how are we gonna be able to make it be a resilient facility when we first looked at this initially without any of sort of the um, energy efficient requirements, we saw we were gonna have to bring in something like, you know, like 20 trucks of fuel a day to power the embassy. So we've been working with our, our the scale of the project to try to shrink it down a little bit. Additionally, um, this building has to be maintainable and has to be functional and operate, it has to be constructible in a very tough construction environment. So. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are important to us. Uh, new Consul General in Curacao by Karen Timberlake. Uh, this is going out to bid soon. This is their UNESCO World Heritage Site with all the colorful buildings. So developing something that was contextual, culturally contextual, without overpowering the importance of that was very important. So there's these series of dichroic glass fins on the project that mimic the various colors of uh, the colorful buildings below. This is the U.S. Embassy in Brasilia by Studio Gang, which has just recently been awarded. This is on an existing compound. We have a number of these where we have really great sites, uh, but the buildings have outlived their useful life. So how do we do multi-phase work on existing compounds while not disrupting and still being doing something that's culturally contextual? This one, you know, Gini Gang is really good about picking up the sinuous curves of the Brazilian architecture and then the, the tile work, all those colors that you see or uh, done out of mosaic tile. This is USMC in Doha, where I mentioned 130, 140 degrees. It's all about shade. How do you reduce the temperature in this area, but also doing something that's culturally contextual. Uh, the sails and using the fabric is very customary in a lot of this part of the world. And then you see the entrance pavilions there with some references to um, Bedouin tents that are uh, culturally significant as well. This is Juba, South Sudan, another one where no water, no power, no energy, no wastewater. Um, additionally, all of the housing is actually needs to be on the site as well. So this is a full campus where we have the recreational facilities, like a gym, cafeteria, little bar, uh, all the housing, all the recreation facilities, all the guards, the drivers uh, that are contracted out to protect uh, the staff when they need to go out, all of them live on the compound in addition to having the actual building itself. So there's a huge PV component. I think. 3.1 gigawatts, I think, is the number of what we're um, trying to design to for this facility. Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the most evacuated posts around the world. So another one that has the housing component on it as well. Um, this has a strong security, but because um, the need to be able to construct this building quickly, um, we work with Shop here, who's done a lot of offsite manufacturing, and we're looking at this one and how it's very repetitive in nature, but it's also um, very unique uh, to, and fits in with the local culture as well. Lagos, Nigeria, if any of you are familiar with, uh, they have the, this is one where population is exponentially growing. Uh, 
uh, there's actually an island. If you go to Google Earth and look at Lagos, Nigeria, you can see this 100 acre island of sand they're building out into the ocean. So we are going to have a, a presence out there in that new development. They get about 1,500 visitors a day. It's one of the largest consular services. So how do you maintain a flow of people working through our facility in a, in a timely manner while not impacting the rest of the operations of the facility? When you go to Lagos, you know, they told us it takes six hours in advance to get to the airport and we just barely made it. The traffic is that bad. Uh, the staff commutes by boat here. Uh, and so they continue to commute by boat. This project has boat maintenance facilities as well, because the boats are owned and operated by uh, the embassy there. So just one of those unique uh, projects in the portfolio. Uh, this is a long way Malawi, huge American center visitation rates here. One of the few places with free and open internet in the country, so people are always coming to use the internet here. The other thing I'll just point out for this one is, you know, the architectural moves that you're seeing are not arbitrary. They're they're all meant to be very functional and performative, and this uh, skin moves and changes as it moves to the various orientations of the building to respond to the sun, but also where there really needs to have that energy reduction on the glazing. This is the new embassy in Riyadh by Morphosis. We're currently investing about $2 billion in Saudi Arabia between this one and Dahran, which is recently completed. A uh, really great project. And while it may look complex, it's really just a concrete box with this wonderful perforated metal screen. So they did a really nice job of uh, making something very simple and easy to construct look very complex. This is Port Louis Mauritius, one of the major trading routes between Africa and Asia. Mauritius is quickly becoming a, a technology and diplomatic outpost. So this is our new facility we're doing there. Uh, this is Asuncion Paraguay under construction. I'll show you a few now that are under construction. Uh, this one's on Bill Clinton Way, an interesting one about Asuncion. Uh, Kampala Knox. Uh, this NOX is a new office NX, sorry uh, about the acronym there. Uh, oftentimes, we're finding uh, these posts are growing at a rate much faster than we can actually get them done. So Kampala is an example where as soon as the building was built, we have started build, started planning, and now we're building the addition here in Kampala. So how interior spaces are able to flex uh, and deal with constant change depending on uh, different presidential initiatives and staffs and important uh, it is something that's very important to us so for example in the last administration dea's presence in latin america uh, grew quite exponentially in ways that we hadn't anticipated so um, examples of where you have done office spaces and how they've accommodated growth and change and flex is something that's also very important to us this is the U.S. Embassy in Beirut, Lebanon, uh, currently under construction. The part that you're actually seeing on the screen is actually only the housing. All the housing needs to be on the compound. Uh, the actual embassy itself is off the top of the page, but while this may look complex, it's really responsive to the site. It's all built of one material, this white concrete, which is they have the tradespeople in Lebanon to really execute this concrete. There's only really about three or four different window typologies here throughout this housing. so. Um, I'm explaining this just to show you that, you know, something that's responsive to the local environment, culture, and site, uh, but also can have its own presence is something that's very important to us. This is the US, U.S. Embassy in Casablanca, Morocco, being built on a new airport site. Uh, this is this is the kind of challenge, really the biggest, biggest challenge we face on all these projects is how can they represent America? represent American values, represent American architecture, but at the same time be locally contextual and contemporary in a way. Um, I think Miller Hall did a great job on this one. You can see the diagonal lines that you see moving, picking up on the nuances and the design motifs from the rugs. Um, if you're familiar with Morocco and they have these really great metal work that they use on lamps. So picking up on that with this perforated metal screen, and then there's these series of small courtyards, which you can see in the middle, they're off to the right. Um, which is also a very uh, culturally important component to how they design their structure. So doing something that's new and contemporary, uh, but culturally relevant, relevant is something that's very important to us. And trying to strike that balance on each of these projects is probably one of the, the biggest challenges uh, that we face on our work. This is Chiang Mai in Thailand by Inead Architects, a series of small pavilions, uh, work play uh, that all nestle into the city here, and this is one where maybe they didn't want a very strong, overt American presence to be a large. So, um, he was very sensitive to the cultural issues here of how this particular land and the environment around it needed to be dealt with. So, they did something that was 
very not very intrusive in the in the local landscape. This is the Consulate General in Rio. This will be one of the tallest buildings in our portfolio once it's completed. And this pathway on the right was really a connector between uh, two different transit stations. But you know, when you went there, people would get robbed. It was in terrible shape. So we worked with the city to say, "Hey, let us do renovate this little piece for you. This walkway. It helps give us more security." But then we just want to use some of it for some of our stormwater management and runoff because our site is so tight. We have all these other things we're trying to put on our site. So this is a good example of where um, the project is doing more than just the architecture, right? It's providing a community amenity, but then also so solving a sustainability uh, water management issue as well. So these are the kinds of things that we try to bring out of all of our projects. How can we do something that's uh, locally contextual, can do something for the community, but then can also help. Uh, with our resilience, climate, and security needs as well. This is Colombo, Sri Lanka. This site is between the ocean and a series of train tracks. So uh, the security issues, the climactic issues, the flooding, uh, all we got it all in this one here. So this one's uh, completed. And another example where now that we're almost done, uh, it's actually ready to uh, do an expansion or some sort of densification of the space inside because that space has grown so much. Windhoek, Namibia by SOM, this is uh, the story I like to tell about this one is when we first went out there and presented the project to the local authorities, uh, the red, we talked about how the red color was of the soil and of the earth, but that particularly red tone we chose was actually from a rival tribe. So the government thought we were coming to support the rival tribe. So we're like, no, 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 that's not. So we basically had to go back and change the color to a more muted color. So it's these cultural issues that we deal with in all these locations. Um, and we've made some mistakes, you know, we've done a series, a whole landscape of white flowers when white flowers represented death in that particular culture, or where we didn't provide prayer facilities, or where cultures where people eat with their hands and we don't provide hand washing facilities. Uh, so there's a lot of these cultural issues that we work through uh, in our projects that are just challenging and unique in many different ways. This is going to be the largest council general in our portfolio, the one in Erbil, Iraq by EYP, now Paige. Guadalajara, Mexico. In Guadalajara, this is another one that gets over a thousand consular visitors a day. And in Mexico, it's like a family event. Everyone gets dressed up and they bring their whole families to come uh, for that one person that's getting a visa. But those people were getting preyed on while they were standing in line. And we were really just all kinds of people in the neighborhood because we only let the one person in that actually is there to get the visa. So. Here we created this interior protected courtyard before our security perimeter to allow a safe space for those people to not get preyed upon by their people selling, selling fake passport stamps and lying to people and really uh, preying on those people. So, and now it, it makes us a better neighbor as well. This is Armacillo, Mexico. This is under construction right now. Uh, what's nice about this one is this sunscreen actually then creates this whole series of outdoor rooms, not really part of the program, but really just expanded the use of the campus. By now, they have all these events and meetings outside in ways that, uh, because it was actually a, quite a small program. Nogales, Mexico, it's hot. If you go to, it's right on the border of Arizona, it's in the desert. Uh, so this one's all about shade. So this really strong expression of shade. If you look at that uh, little image on the left, uh, those are it's an Ocotillo cactus plant, which they use to shelter. You see these little shelters all over the city selling coconuts and all kinds of things. But we took that and made that into a more modern motif. You see that in the canopies. You see it in the large canopy. And it's also brought into the interior spaces as well. So uh, when we presented this, the, the mayor of the city actually gave us an embroidered Mexican flag. He was so pleased that we or made something so culturally relevant. So there's, I just wanted to give you a sample. There's some of these projects. I know I'm getting short on time, so I'm gonna move through a lot of these here at the end, but um, we're interested in doing great design work, solving these functional problems, doing architecture is very performative, uh, culturally contextual, uh, while meeting all of our security functional needs that are easy to operate and maintain, because ultimately they have to be maintainable by our staff, in many cases, local staff. Uh, so these aren't just buildings that um, we can just, get a new uh, AC unit on the local market, right? So they have to be resilient. Uh, this is a new project in Dahran by SOM, recently completed. We're really excited about this one. Uh, and this is at US Embassy Maputo, right on the water. Uh, this one is 
pulling from the wood carving culture, which is really strong there in Mozambique, and turning that into this high performance concrete sunshade as it moves around the building. And another thing that's very important to note as I move into this last segment of the embassy effect is, you know, wherever we plant the flag, you know, things build up all around us. Uh, Guatemala City is a perfect example. When we first went and looked at the site, there was sheep farms. We were like, who's going to come out here? But now it's all developed and the city's really expanded all the way around to our area. So this impact that this work has uh, on around the country, we call this the embassy effect, right? So there's an economic, environmental, and social impact that these projects have. Uh, very similar to the triple bottom line, if you will. Um, but from an economic standpoint, even in a place like Nine Elms in London, which is a very robust urban city, you know, it really changed the, the course of development in that part of the city. Um, in Nogales, Marriott bought a site, built and opened a hotel before we broke ground. Uh, and so people understand now there's a Walmart and a Home Depot surrounding the site. Uh, and about 40% of the money on these projects get recirculated back into these communities. It's a huge boom, particularly in some of these countries that will have a big, robust construction activity happening. Well, I think I touched something. I messed up. Let's go back to the presentation. Yeah, at the bottom right. Sorry. You have 35 minutes. So you're doing well. We have plenty of time for questions. So from an economic standpoint, um, these projects have a huge economic impact. In Mexico City, we're training um, crane workers. As soon as we get them trained, they move off and, and get hired by somebody else. You know, and that can be a big um, economic impact for that family. But now they have a formal crane operator in their family now that serves as a breadwinner. Um, from a social aspect, we have a lot of these art exchanges. Um, the very first slide, the big number slide, I think it shows something like over 12,000 artists we work with. Um, and these art exchanges also become really important acts of diplomacy. A lot of these are site specific pieces that we're doing and then you can go to art and embassies. If any of you have never been to the art and embassies YouTube channel, I highly encourage you to go, but they walk through this process of collaboration between a local artist and an American artist and creating these pieces for these projects, really exciting stuff. Also, here's our project in Bangkok. You know, they have an environmental impact. In Bangkok here, it's all about flooding. The city is sinking to the tune of, you know, half a centimeter a year or something like that. So um, how we display to other countries that we are stewards of their, their resources um, is in itself a diplomatic act. So how we can, through design, use design as a diplomatic activity is something that we're very interested in. And then in some place like a Matamoros, the very first time the team went down there, the driver that was supposed to pick them up had got shot and killed that morning before they actually even started. It was a very crime-ridden neighborhood, uh, crime-ridden part of the city, but now it's got park space and theaters, and I mean, it didn't, it helped that El Chapo got arrested, but, you know, this part of the city is now vibrant, and you see women walking children in strollers, and um, a lot of this has to do with our projects and the development, the impact that they have. Um, last time I was down there, the council general said, you know, I can get a meeting with anybody I want to in the city because they want to come see this building. And that's the impact that this architecture has on diplomacy. You know, it really becomes an act of, hey, this is nice. We care about you. We care about your country and we want to engage with you in that way. And then also just from a historic standpoint, even in a city like Milan, uh, what you're seeing here in the foreground was a historic a building that had fallen into disrepair. This site was a former uh, gun drill sergeant gunnery, uh, I forget the term I'm looking for right now, uh, part of the city, but the drill team, sorry. Um, so that long narrow piece you see in the middle, now we've restored it and it becomes incorporated into the entry sequence into the compound. So you move to the security compound and you move through this uh, restored uh, drill team uh, gun, gun range portion. And then that piece in the front is historic, it's being restored and becomes a place for Italian, American, uh, diplomatic exchanges and cultural exhibits and so forth that's going to be open to the public when it's finally open. So uh, we're always looking for these opportunities where we can engage the public. And in some cases, I've been in places like in Slovakia where they just had, you know, a string and panels hung between two trees right outside um, engaging with nine on 9-11, on uh, the history of 9-11. But there were tons of people just stopping and looking and reading and learning about that history as they were going about their day. So 
um, creating these opportunities where we can engage with the locals is something that's very important. Uh, this last one here in Hyderabad, this one is, was where they had these sacred stones that they said we could not move. We can't touch these stones. So Rashar and Kenny did a great job, I think, designing the facility and the moves and the paths around these stones, keeping them intact where they were, and we protected them throughout construction. And this is going to be very important to our local community and becomes an act of diplomacy as well. So I got through it in an hour, and I wanted to leave plenty of time for your questions and answers. Uh, so I hope I gave you some a lot of things to think about, about what's important to us and what's important to this work and why this work is so important, and the excitement that uh, joining the program, building, growing with us to get the opportunity to maybe in the future do one of these larger projects is something that I hope um, those of you who are not involved in the program, uh, I hope I convince you to give us a shot and think about pursuing our work. So thank you with that and we'll open it up to the questions. Lauren, are you reading off the questions or we got or Andrew reading them off to me? Um, I was unmuting myself. I'm right here. I'm gonna go through okay. uh, right now. So we've got a couple that came in. Um, one is, first one we have is if you're, if you have a relevant projects that are outside of the timeline for the five year primary projects, can we add those um, as supplemental information? If the, they won't be considered if it's outside of the, I mean, there's no, the supplemental information is kind of a, a game that we're not interested in playing this time around. The people had hundreds of pages of supplemental information that we had to go through. So we're gonna probably hold people to the page limits. And then if we ask for certain things, provide certain things within the context of what has been asked. Um, but these, you know, multi hundred page appendices that came in, uh, they have to be reviewed. They have to be commented on. So we're going to try to cut that back a little bit this time, I hope. But it's not the contracting folks will have to do that. Great. Uh, the next one we have is if you plan. If you plan to have an architectural consultant on with OBO experience, should they be part of stage 1? If they're not going to be the lead designer, I would say probably not. Right, if they're not going to be the primary contact, a lot of firms in stage two will add their, um, you know, for small firms that want a big powerhouse OBO experienced architect, which is a path that a lot of people take, um, that would come in stage two. But it, you know, that's not going to impact who the lead designer is and who the AE firm is that is our primary point of contract, unless it's going to you're going to be submitting it as a official joint venture then you would need to bring them on board um, and submit it as a joint venture. So that's between you and that other architecture. Uh, question we have regarding contracting. What is the smallest firm you would realistically contract with? Well, I mean, when we brought Studio Ma on board, I think they had 10 people, 12 people. Kirk and Sexton had maybe 25 people out of Chicago. We brought them for some work. Um, Caples Jefferson recently had a contract with us. I don't think they're much larger than the 15 to 20 person range. Uh, I could be wrong there, but, um, yeah, the, the scale of the firm is, I mean, our contracting folks will work with people we have in the contract. We want you to be successful. So we're not going to assign anybody a project that we don't think they can handle or that they don't think they can handle. So, um, we work very closely with. The small firms we have and assign there's plenty of work um, so we assign appropriate small scale work to the small scale firms if that's what they're interested in and small scale firms that are interested in the big work that show us they have a powerhouse firm uh, that's going to be doing all their production or whatever or understands our classified components that's going to be supporting them then that's you know we scale that work appropriately so um, no limits on the size or scale of the firms okay um, similar to that one, how can new companies become part of design teams? I don't know. I understand the question. Um, well, one, one thing I would suggest is, um, if you're looking to get work with OBO and, uh, you're looking to join on a team, you could check out the current holders of our IDIQs, 
reach out with them. Yep, that's a good point. Our, our current contract holders, there's nothing that precludes them from adding an additional specialty. Like um, if you have a historic specialty or you have you specialize in carbon or something, um, there's nothing that precludes any of our existing contract holders from adding additional capacity and specialties uh, to their to their firms. So you, you just have to go through the clearance process just like everybody else to get your firm and the staff working on our projects uh, cleared. I hope that answers uh, you. Yeah. Uh, another question we have, just a general IDIQ question um, submitted here. Uh, many of the contracts are design bid Design build bridging. How are relationships established between builders and designers? If you could give some guidance for that, that would be great. So we contract the bridging portion of the design through our IDIQ contracts, and then we bid publicly the design build portion. And it's usually the contractor is driving that, and they are bringing an AE team with them, which also gets evaluated as part of. As a, as a technical review as part of their bid proposal. Um, sometimes it's best value, sometimes it's lowest price technically acceptable. Um, so depending on the project, there may be a, a, a thing that, that you, we're gonna evaluate you on that's very clear, but how do you build those relationships? Um, you can look on our website about those who are winning our work, I guess, on the construction side and reach out to those con construction contractors who are consistently bidding and winning our work and express an interest to them that you're interested in uh, being a part of their teams. Uh, we've got another one um, regarding just general IDIQs. Um, George is asking, are design teams encouraged to include building envelope consultants? Absolutely, envelope commissioning is so important to us on the lead front um, because of our operation and maintenance. I mean, there's nothing, yeah, that's a great, addition to a team. Um, Amy is wondering if it's possible, if it's possible to expand on how we, um, a bit on the office security and the requirements for the modernization IDIQ. The office security, uh, all that comes through our diplomatic security folks. If you are selected at the end, they walk you through that process. There's a, uh, Facility clearance, your space that you're going to be working out of gets cleared and the people get cleared concurrently and separately. So there's two different clearances uh, that occur. The individuals you identify, there is a position we call a facility security officer you have to identify. They get training on how to maintain your space. So I would say that that's not something to worry about. If you're picked, we walk you through that process. We let you know what you have to do. Uh, it's a long process, it's an expensive process, but we take you through that process every step of the way. And what was the second part of the question, Lauren? Um, About the ice. Sorry. Go ahead, Andrew. About, it was about the IDIQ, the IDIQ process, I think. Uh, yes, the questions, it's gone from Slido, but we'll we'll circle back to it. Um, I've got another one regarding a general IDIQ um, inquiry. Um, and I know we touched on this during the presentation, but people were in and out, so it might be just a good uh, good time to reinforce um, timelines. Remember, hold on, hold, hold that thought for a second. It was about the modernization and renovation IDIQ. Um, like I said, that's not guaranteed that that's what the next IDIQ is gonna be. Uh, when we were first putting together this roadshow, we identified a need. Um, we also think that there's, regardless of what how the contract goes out that need is still going to exist so there's going to be a large number of modernization renovation projects that are going to happen in the future so regardless of how it gets released whether it's the big one whether it's a small one modernization whether it's small business no matter what it is um there's a need there we're experienced doing that kind of work sorry no that was actually what i was queuing up for you just to reinforce that so that was the one that i was going for um, and then the next one highlighted here, um, just clarifying for Grace, since the last IDIQ was released in 2016, is it that the modernization and renovation IDIQ is coming out in 2023? Um, like I said, can't confirm what it's going to be in 2023. Uh, 
we're still working through the details of it. Okay, we've got another one here. Um, uh, a lot of them are just, uh, we can go ahead, Andrew, and clear the ones regarding the timeline, um, confirming when the release of the IDIQ is, but I see one just switching it up. Uh, stage two, uh, where did it go? I'm sorry. Stage two indicates assembling team. If sub consultants are determined in separate IDIQs, what teams are assembled in stage two? The entire engineering, we will identify exactly which consultants need to be included as part of the stage two at a minimum. We'll give you a minimum, it'll be mechanical, electrical, plumbing, civil, structural, telecom, electrical, so forth. So we'll lay out for you the minimum consultant team that needs to be included for consideration. And then we give you the opportunity to add additional consultants uh, that you see fit or think that you want to bring uh, to OBO and why they're important for OBO to, why they make your team unique. So that's something that you're able to do in stage two. But we'll lay out the basic minimum uh, consultants that need to be included and then give opportunities for you to add additional ones. And those consultants do not need to be on an IDIQ already? They do not need to be on an IDIQ already. No, they don't. And, you know, no offense to a lot of the consultants that are working with us, but we'd love to have some new consultants too. A lot of the same consultants show up on multiple teams, um, but, you know, we're interested in getting new talent on the engineering side as well, not just on the architecture side. Great. Speaking of subconsultants, uh, we've got a question regarding landscape subconsultants. Um, just pull that one up. Sorry, it seemed to have disappeared right now. Uh, we can go to another one that um, will help kind of lay out how people can introduce their firms to us, uh, Curtis. Uh, somebody's asking regarding capabilities conversation. If it's an initial presentation, qualifications, if it's recommended that firms request one, what's your opinion on it? Not required, not necessary. Um, it's a good way to start building that relationship with us for us to see you so that the first time your proposal comes in was like we've never heard of you before. Um, we do record them. We make them available to uh, staff if they were inclined to watch them. But it, we've done them a lot of different ways. Sometimes it's just uh, another question and answer session just like this. Some people like to present and show us their work and show us that they're qualified, but there's no decisions being made as part of those. They're just informal. We limit them to once a month. So I know they get backed up so that we can, you know, we, we have work to do. We can't just talk to y'all all, all day, every day. So once a month, we set up a period of time and then our external affairs team makes sure that the right people are in the room. If you're an engineering firm or you're a landscape firm, we'll make sure there's a landscape architect or people from our planning group are being there with you or the people, um, we have this whole tree canopy study we're doing right now, tracking carbon through our landscape architecture group. Um, there's site planning issues, master planning issues. There are, so maybe if there's a certain niche that your team is, uh, or your firm is focused on, then our external affairs team does a great job getting the right people in the room uh, to get your questions answered. Great. Um, and just to give a little bit more insight, Curtis mentioned they're once a month and we set them up in blocks and they're 20 minute conversations. Um, and we'll, we'd be happy to do it with anybody looking to do um, work with OBO and present their firms. Uh, another question for you here, um, Curtis. Uh, we've got Monica uh, said she saw a lot of beautiful landscapes in the projects. As Curtis said, there is no IDIQ for landscape architects. Can you clarify how we bid to join a team? Yeah, so the landscape architects would be something that would get added during the stage two. So once we publish the stage one um, short list of architecture firms, um, they they are then in the process of making up their team. So uh, you should encourage the architecture firms you're working with already to apply. So that when they make it to stage two, you already have that uh, relationship there, or you're more welcome to reach out to all of those stage one winners um, and present your landscape qualifications to them once we announce that short list. Uh, and that'll be then you can be added to their team that way. Great. Uh, we'll take a couple um, focus on the program. Uh, Jeffrey is asking, are you able to speak? Uh, 
to the design process, how the design firm works with OBO, how slash when interaction with local architecture and local officials occurs, et cetera. Yeah. So that's, you know, we have about 1200 people here at OBO and for every consultant that you may bring on your team, we have an office here of embassy experts in that particular discipline. So all the engineering disciplines, art, technical security, physical security, um, energy, like I said, our climate security resilience people are deeply ingrained in studying hurricanes and earthquakes and tsunamis. Um, so that the process basically is at a very early stage where we're doing our due diligence. We're going out and meeting with local officials, meeting with local utility companies, understanding capacity. We're drilling piles to get uh, learn about the soil on the site. Uh, we're meeting with local water, local municipal authorities zoning. Um, and those meetings are occurring very early on as part of the site acquisition process. Then in that time, usually we're starting to build these relationships with local architects. Sometimes if we have an existing embassy there, they are working with local architects. They can, and we usually sometimes bring all of them in for an introduction session to the architects that we're bringing with us. So we give you as our architecture consultant, the opportunity to meet several different local architects, or you can set up meetings with your own architects that the embassy is already working with, or if there's someone that you know or wanna meet in that country, um, you can do it that way. And then as part of these early studies, we're looking at, we're really documenting what is the local permit process? We're really trying to find all of the risks possible before we really, really even start design. And all of that goes into a course of action and a project development survey document that then gets reviewed and commented on, and then a draft and a final, so that before we start a project, we know how long the permit's gonna take so we can start estimating schedules. Uh, we know how long getting a zoning variance is gonna take if we need to. Uh, and that really just lays out the path of the project. During design, I would say, if you've never worked with OBO, we are, we are a tough client, right? We're talking, you know, our mechanical engineer is going to re be reviewing mecha your mechanical engineer. Our electrical engineer is going to be reviewing your electrical drawings. On a recent construction document submission, OBO produced about 2,500 comments for the for the AE team to respond to and resolve before we would pass that set of documents on to the next phase. So um, we're a very involved, engaged client. We're deeply ingrained in the design process. We, do, we bring in outside industry through our industry advisory reviews to critique their work. We have senior management reviews uh, where various levels of OBO management reviews and critiques, that, critiques your work. Um, even on the technical evaluation panels for this, an IDAQ like this one, it's not just gonna be architects reviewing the work, it's gonna be engineers, planners, interior designers, people from our facilities teams, people from our uh, construction management teams, our construction executives. So all these things I've been talking about need to resonate, uh, your work needs to resonate with all of these different people. The architecture is actually just a small portion of the re of the review process. There's a whole team of people, um, something when they were 25 or 30 different groups within the organization at any given moment, depending on the program, that's gonna have a, a stake in the project. For example, if there's a medical unit, we have our medical office that manages all of our doctors. They wanna see how the medical unit in the project that we're designing is gonna work and we, Say, yeah, you review it. It's got to work for you in that country. And then in places where there's maybe where, uh, Americans have gastro problems, they'll be like, we need another shower room and we need another bedroom. We need another bathroom in this particular med unit for this particular location. And we'll alter the design to accommodate that. So that's just one example of the kind of uh, multitude of voices that have a role in the design process for us. I hope that answered your question. Because we're, we're a tough client. I'm not gonna lie. Having been on the outside doing this work as a consultant, um, I experienced it and now that I'm on the inside, I know, you know, you get people held. That's what we do. <laughs> We've got time for a couple more. Um, I have one here from Jordan, uh, wondering how the responsibilities are divided between design architect and architect of record. Right, so the, it, for des for design build bridging project, uh, the design architect will take that project to about 25, 30%. And then when it goes out to bid, uh, that design architect becomes extensions of us as the client. Uh, we bring them on board and now they're commenting on the architect of records drawings alongside us and coming out and visiting and inspecting sites with us. And they become an extension of OBO essentially 
on the design build side. So the architect of record is the one that the contractor brings on board with them. We're actually completing the full construction documents. Great. So design architects engaged and involved through the whole life of the entire project. Um, I've got one here from Emily, just a general question about the IDIQ. Um, for a lead AE proposer, are we, are we recommending to propose one consultant per discipline or would OBO be interested in having options within the IDIQ team? You mean like having multiple mechanical engineers, multiple electrical engineers is my assumption. Yeah, you know, they, they have a reason for it. You know, if they're each bringing something different to the table, um, but it should be your team that you're going to work with that you're comfortable working with that you know how to execute work with and have confidence that they're going to get work done um, in a timely manner and to meet all of our design standards. You know, our, we have a 6,000 page design standards. It's, it's a tough nut to crack if you've never done our work before. Um, but, you know, so maybe there's a, a rationale for having one mechanical that does this and another mechanical that does control systems or something. I don't know. Um, but if you have a rationale behind it, just make sure that's very clear as you're explaining your team makeup, I think. And yeah, we'd be open to that. Uh, we've got a couple more. Here's another um, general IDIQ one um, from Grace. Is the IDIQ process a rolling deadline to get on the list? No, uh, it happens once every few years. And then that's that's why I'm out here doing this now because people are like, I missed it. I didn't know about it. So. I'm, we're traveling the country. We're doing these virtually. We're, we don't anybody to have give me the excuse for the next four years that I missed it. So uh, it's not a rolling deadline. It's going to come out once. And we're going to do the big uh, review and do the interviews once. So pick, and then we're done for a while because it's a five-year contract. So it's not going to come out for another four years because it takes us about a year to do the entire contracting and the with the RFP release. Stage one, stage two, the interviews, the awards, it takes us about maybe about more closer to like 16, 18 months from the time it's first released to actually getting people on board. So um, once we do it, we're not going to do it for a while. It's not going to be a rolling basis. Um, I've got another uh, general IDIQ question uh, for Stephen. Um, let, me, let me just add one more thing though. But yeah. with the three different IDIQs we have, there are going to be different IDIQs coming out more sporadically, I think now, you know, the support services, the design, top secret. So the idea is that there's sort of an evolution and you can in, engage and graduate or move on to next one and more and more complex ones if you make one. So the idea is that maybe the big one, the one you're interested in, maybe come out only four years, but we'll be releasing IDIQs on a, on a more regular basis. Great, good to know. Um, so we've got Stephen here. He was pointing out that um, example project types for the upcoming modernization and restoration IDIQ are engineering. Um, prior selections seem to lean towards architect led. Does OBO have a preference? No, it's all kinds of projects. Um, compound security upgrades, lease fit outs. Um, even if there's something like, you know, a fuel tank or like a facade repair, in many cases, we're impacting the architecture and the representational face of the project. So we usually still have architects leading those teams. Um, our support services, some of them, some of those activities are very engineering focused. So it made a lot of sense for us to have engineer leads um, as part of that IDIQ contract. But for the design contracts, uh, they're, they're primarily architect led. We have not, I'm not saying we're against it, or we just have not awarded an engineering led um, design IDIQ contract. We haven't awarded one of those yet, to my knowledge. Um, we're, we've got three minutes left, so I don't know if uh, you want to say anything to close it out, Curtis. I am going to uh, drop in the chat an email address. So we're going to look at the questions we have here. We'll get answers to uh, everybody who whose questions we didn't get in Slido, but if there's anything additional, uh, please grab the email address I'm about to drop into the chat and send your questions our way and we'll make sure to get you guys the answers. Um, Curtis, if there's anything else you'd like to uh, say before we're, we're at time, I wanna give you that moment. Yeah, I, I would just say thank you. You know, we're hoping we may still get out to the West Coast to do this in person um, in the new year, since it looks like 
I, when we initially started this and conceived of this and getting the word out, we thought the contract may be out by the end of the year. That's not going to be the case. It's clearly going to come out sometime next year, we hope. Uh, so we have some time to uh, get the word out even further. Uh, so we may do some West Coast dates, uh, but for those of you that have met me in person in New Orleans and Austin and Minneapolis and Kansas City, thank you. It's been a lot of great fun engaging. And actually, we're learning a lot about what's important to you and the kinds of things. We're getting great feedback for what to really think about and put in while we're designing this uh, new RFP. So it's been great to hear from people and understand what's important and some of the challenges that they've faced in the past coming chasing after our work um, so that we can try to, you know, I don't want to say just make the barrier of entry lower, but we do want, we still want the best, but we do want to make it something that's not, that does not feel like it's not feasible for people to pursue. I think there's a lot of examples of the firms on our list that are not, are small, but mighty, and they do great work. And we want you to know we recognize great work no matter the scale and no matter the part of the country it comes from. So we're after getting that regional diversity uh, represented in our uh, contracts. We do projects all over the world. And so it's important that we have different voices and different ways of thinking and looking at our work, uh, part of our portfolio. So uh, with that, thank you very much. I hope I inspired you to pursue our work and I hope everyone has a happy, happy holidays. Thank you.